Welcome to our panel uh, on uh, Achebe and Baldwin at 40. Um, I want to thank the panelists for agreeing to be a part of this. Everyone here with, uh, with attended the ALA banquet that evening and knows this story well. I'm Eileen Julian. It is an honor and a great pleasure to preside over this uh, initial roundtable uh, for this event commemorating the encounter of um, Chinua Achebe and James Baldwin in 1980 at Gainesville. That was the fifth annual meeting of the African Literature Association, which was a very young association at that point. It had been uh, created, if you will, in 1974-75. Um, I want to begin by, first of all, expressing gratitude to Professor Brenda Chalfin, her assistants, especially um, Alani Ilori, with whom I've spoken many times so far, uh, and all of the Gainesville team who put together this meeting, this event to commemorate that encounter between Chinua Achebe and James Baldwin some 40 years ago. I also want to recognize the inspired organization of that event, of that fifth annual meeting of the African Literature Association um, by Mildred Hill Lubin and Bernadette Caillé, who, who made it possible and who had the brilliant idea to put those two extraordinary writers, intellectuals, and ultimately inimitable human beings together to bring them together uh, for um, the, the audience of the ALA. I'm gonna say a few words about Achebe and Baldwin, and then I'll introduce the speakers. Achebe was born in 1930, and he died in 2013. He published his first novel, Things Fall Apart, in 1958. That novel rocked the literary world. I think we could say that fairly. It was followed by No Longer at Ease, Arrow of God, A Man of the People, Antils of the Savannah, and many more books of essays and short stories, which we've also pondered over, read, taught, and loved for the last 50 years. Achebe's early novels are a preface to the coming storm of decolonization and seemingly endless cycles of violence and upheaval in sub-Saharan Africa. And I don't know if you've listened to the news these days, but right now there are extraordinary uh, manifestations, protests going on in, in Nigeria. Excuse me. More importantly, perhaps, there can be no question about Chinua Achebe's extraordinary achievement in, re in revisioning, his revisioning of history, his grasp of the capacity of literature, the novel especially, and his compelling prose to force on the world an entirely different reading of colonial conquest. He put the premises of empire and colonialism under the looking glass with a freshness and force that were remarkable and unprecedented. And he did so in a short narrative accessible to millions of people around the world, schooled and less schooled. James Baldwin was born in 1924 and died in 1987. Part of his fame rests on his status as an expatriate in Paris in mid-century. In fact, he's one of the authors I, I teach in my course on Black Paris and he's one of the highlights of that course. He went to Paris at the invitation of Richard Wright. He published Go Tell It on the Mountain in 1953, followed by his first book of essays, Notes of a Native Son in 1955, then Giovanni's Room, Another Country, and innumerable essays and short stories, including the wondrous Sonny's Blues, which I'm sure almost everyone knows, and a favorite of mine, less well-known, This Morning, This Evening, So Soon, that, that uh, short story is in his collection, Going to Meet the Man. He later became deeply involved in the civil rights struggle uh, of Black Americans in the U.S. Baldwin was a passionate and astute observer of race and the workings of racism in the United States, which he argues in one of his most important insights, especially given that period, that the United States nonetheless created hybrid black and white Americans. And while he captures and represents 30 years before Toni Morrison, the concept of whites playing in the dark, as she called it, he nonetheless falls prey in my reading 
as did other intellectuals of the 1950s, to the idea that enslaved Africans landing in the Americas were a tabula rasa and that black people like himself could not own the modern world made by Shakespeare, Dante, Michelangelo, Aeschylus, Racine, as might illiterate whites. Ultimately, as I recall, both Achebe and Baldwin were humbled and in awe of each other that evening in April of, of 1980. Each of them having struggled with the conundrum of calling out injustice while insisting on shining a light on fortitude and the unending battle for human dignity. Now, let me introduce the speakers, our panelists. The first speaker will be Kenneth Harrow. Ken is professor of English at Michigan State University. His publications include Threshold of Change in African Literature, The Emergence of a Tradition, Less Than One in Double, and African Cinema, Postcolonial and Feminist Readings. Most recently, Ken has worked on a new critical approach to African cinema, one that requires that we revisit the beginnings of African filmmaking and the critical responses to which they gave rise, and that we ask what limitations they might have contained what price was paid for the approaches then taken and whether we are still caught in those limitations today. Our second speaker will be Nana, Professor Nana Baniwa Horn. Professor Horn is a professor of English, Africana and Gender Studies who has taught in universities in Ghana and the US and she's published scholarly as well as creative works. She has two published collections of poetry and two uh, more collections of poetry in the pipeline. She's also written a short story, Payback, which appears in Payback and Other Stories, edited by Tommy, Tommy, Tommy Adiaga. Professor Horn is currently working also on a book on gender in Guinean literature and an additional collection of short stories. She was installed uh, as the third queen mother of Aquamufie, and that installment and that ceremony and the community of which she's a part was filmed by the um, exceptional African documentary filmmaker, Jean-Marie Tenno. So we're very pleased to have her. She will be talking a little bit about her experience as a student when this, um, when this meeting in 1980 took place. Our third speaker will be Professor Aliko Songolo who is a professor emeritus in the Department of French and Italian and the Department of African Cultural Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research and teaching interests are in Francophone literatures of Africa and the Caribbean and Francophone cinemas in Africa. His current research projects investigate the question of national cinema in Francophone Africa, post-coloniality in the wake of the Negritude movement and the complex web of relationships among African-American writers and their Francophone African and Caribbean counterparts between the 1920s and the 1960s. He has published on Aimé Césaire and a range of African writers. He served as chair of the Department of French and Italian, chair of the Department of African Cultural Studies, formerly known as African Languages and Literature, director of the African Studies Program, director of the Center for Interdisciplinary French Studies, and as Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs at the University of California, Irvine, uh, before he moved to Wisconsin. He was twice president of the African Literature Association and president of the African Studies Association. Finally, Professor Dorothy Randall Suruta. Professor Suruta um, served three terms as chair of Africana Studies at San Francisco State University of particular um, significance for her was the fact that she got to spend time with Chinua Achebe and James Baldwin in that 1980 um, meeting at the University of Florida. She, was, she had been commissioned by the Black Scholar Journal to meet them, to work with them, to write about them. And she published an article, quote, the title of which is In Dialogue to Define Aesthetics, James Baldwin and Chinua Achebe. This was published in March, April, 1981 um, in the Black Scholar Journal. She, she is presently working on two biographies of um, 
two biographies, a book of poetry, among other literary projects. She serves as a judge for the annual College Language Association Poetry Contest, and she's on the board of directors for the National Council for Black Studies. She has co-edited special issues of the International Journal of African Africana Studies and the Western Journal of Black Studies. Her article, Cultural Memory in the Works of Langston Hughes, was published in Memory and the Narrative Imagination uh, by Bedford Press, Press in 2011. Her essay, Regal and Royal, Chicago's Extraordinary Maud Martha, appeared in Gwendolyn Brooks' Maud Martha, a, cur a critical collection. This was published by Third World Press in 2002. Most recently, she proposed a panel and presented in January 2020 at the Modern Language Association annual meeting, which took place in Seattle, Washington. She's also published in the MLA's journal Concerns. Um, she cherishes the fact that she was able to uh, have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with, with Achebe and Baldwin uh, in April of 1980, and she has a lot to tell us about uh, the relationships that she experienced with them. Okay. That's it. Um, we will now turn to our first speaker, speaker uh, Ken Harrow, who presents a really wonderful contextualization of that meeting in 1980. It's a great meeting. Forty years ago, Baldwin <coughs> met Achebe in Gainesville, and I know that because I was there. And because all of you, our kind hosts, have set up our, our kind hosts have set up this event. I wouldn't have remembered exactly what year it was without this invitation. And I thank Brenda Chalfin for this kind invitation to return to the past. My memory is fixed at the event at the banquet and the rest is certainly fuzzier. <clears throat> Here's what I remember. <clears throat> we came together at the banquet <clears throat> at a motel. Baldwin spoke about just returning to America for the first time in a long time. He returned very uncertain about the choice, having left for a country marked by racism and the struggles and prejudices that made his life here intolerable. He had been abroad. It may not have been in paradise in France, but it was a relief to escape the life he had known here. My memory of his position and MLK's positions at the time was that they had not been as radical as the revolutionary figures that we embraced, like Soldat Brother. It was already, it was already 1980, 10 years into the fading of the revolution, 12 years since Malcolm had been shot, 20 years since the years of independence had been morphing into the disillusionment of Hanidi Amin, Emperor Bokasa, Amadou Ahijo, Sekoutoure, and so on. So few lights, so much struggle, so long since the victory of the Algerian revolution with little to sustain that hope since. 10 years since the 1970s dimming of hopes, Semen's Chala really catching the moment in 1974. So, 1980, 14 years since Achebe's Man of the People, no Nobel, Nobel Prize yet, for the one whom many considered Africa's greater, greatest writer. 10 years marking the end of Nigeria's civil war, the failed Biafran revolution, the failed attempt at creating an Igbo state, which Achebe had put his heart and soul into. When Achebe came to Gainesville, he was considered our hero. He had not yet written there was a country in which he finally declared his partisanship in favor of Igbo superiority. Nor had he written Ant Hills, a fine novel, but not strong enough to gain him that Nobel Prize. He had passed his moments of ascendancy. And in retrospect, I say he had become one of our respected men of letters, respected, but no longer at the peak of his creative accomplishments. We honored him. We were in tune with his novelist, his teacher, taught his repost to Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. He embodied the voice we taught. He had become a classic. So Baldwin and he met two great figures, but not revolutionaries. And like us, they had passed through the violence of those hot years of 1960s and early 70s, the years of the struggle, only to see the intensity fade into acceptance and stature. What might we have expected of this moment? When two major literary figures meet, especially for the first time, it will be a symbolic honoring of the importance 
of the other writer to each of them. The graceful accolades and biographical accounting of how the other had figured in their own world. How coming to this moment represent, represented something important for them. We sat with our banquet plates, the crumbs and forks, listening politely, with pleasure hearing the accolades, the dignified basking, the challenge Baldwin made to America when, in his decision to return, yet again to see what changes had occurred, what further struggle might be undertaken. I would say he had been, he was the more eloquent at that time. And then, as they say, something happened. Static on the line, as Achebe was talking. Someone was speaking, a crossing of voices. We couldn't hear it clearly. The sound system messing up. A voice then coming clearly enough for all to hear, then to hear more. The cursing of blacks, the N-word again and again, and people standing. Baldwin responding, I didn't come back to America to quaver before your bigotry. We put our fists in the air and shouted approval. We would not give in to this damn deep south. These bigots that we had known all along were there. We would not quit. We would stand shoulder to shoulder with James Baldwin and Chinua Achebe, our heroes. And yes, fight for them, for our right to be there with them in that damn south of hell that we had struggled against for all those years. <clears throat> we were the ALA, united in the struggle for liberation. Remember that? We believed then and again in the struggle. And for those of us who were so much into that moment then, we still believe in it now. But we know too, it is distant, another age, another country. We can believe only in the form of a memory, not as a principle of action. After all, aren't we the vulnerable population who were supposed to remain in quarantine and who ever heard, who ever heard of a revolution in quarantine? We salute each other through some belief in having shared a moment when two great black writers met and in knowing and proving that that moment really mattered. When our grandchildren will ask why, we will know the answer, even if it's not the answer of today. And I think I can say with assurance, we would not have the answers of today, the Black Lives Matter, the demonstrations in the street and the resistance to fascism and white supremacy again, if we had not known with the absolute assurance of young people then that what we were saying and teaching was what really mattered. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Um, what I admire in that, in Ken's presentation, and the reason I thought we should begin with it is because it is both contextual in terms of history and politics, um, as well as looking specifically at the figures of Baldwin and and uh, Achebe and that the events of that evening. So I think that that's a it's a good beginning. That there there are issues there one could query um, and try to um, it, it, you know in, investigate. So, okay. Um, second speaker will be Nana. My name is Nana Benua Horn. And Nana Ansuma, the third of Akwemifi. I am currently retired from professing and I am concentrating more on writing now that I don't have to be burdened with teaching, service, and all those beautiful uh, triumvirate that dominates academic life. I am trying to invest more in writing. Um, I, I'm coming from a different place. The year Chinua Achebe and James Baldwin were invited to the African Literature Association Conference and that it was held in Gainesville, the place that I was coming for my graduate studies. After Mildred had recruited me in Ghana, 
was just to me an act of God. Because at the time, I had had some exposure to Baldwin. Um, you know, I had my first degree, honest in English. I had taught for seven years at the university I graduated from. And finally, I was able to leave home to come and pursue my advanced studies. And that, that was the year that Baldwin and Achebe both were in Gainesville. So to me, it was like waiting on God to come on, you know, come down. You know, like you go to uh, Pentecostal churches and the spirit is really coming down on people and they're speaking in tongues and whatnot. I, that was where my head was. And fortunately, I was taking a class with Mildred and she made her class undertake the responsibility of preparing some entertainment for the conference attendees and also cooking some African food that, you know, they can taste. That's about all one can do at conferences, have a taste of something. So, Fortunately, by the time I came to do graduate studies here, I had started preparing. And I had read Baldwin's, James, uh, James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. And to me, that is his favorite work. The whole time I was there at the banquet, looking at Baldwin, I was actually envisioning James Grimes, the character in Go Tell It on the Mountain, who's, who is raised by his mother and has this rigid father who also reminded me very much of Okonko. And I was sitting there just mesmerized in my own world, you know, being taken on all these journeys by these two greats. And I'm watching Baldwin and reading the character of James Grimes in him, you know, his past, his, you know, biography. I was seeing, I was attributing details from the novel to him. And uh, I really was giving a good welcome to America when suddenly, from nowhere, there was this voice from hell using curse words attacking Baldwin and the entire conference could hear clearly what was being said so I just was overwhelmed. I had thought things had changed. Even though I was studying African American literature, I thought, oh, this was written so long ago, and now, you know, it's different, and black people are free all over the world, and all that. No. That voice over whatever it was, who intruded into our gathering, just brought the nastiness 
of America that you hear on the news and are read about through literature right home to me. It kind of dimmed my enthusiasm a bit, but I was, it was also like an act of God because anybody at the conference will testify to how the conference became church. A subject matter that Baldwin develops in his novel, we'll go tell it on the mountain in detail. And uh, it really made me realize, okay, I'm home. America is home now for me. And Baldwin, I'm seeing in the flesh. And I really was in heaven on earth. Fortunately, I was also sitting right next to Dr. Mildred Hilluben, and so I was in the front area and could see both Achebe and Baldwin really close. And whilst Baldwin seemed to me like somebody who can even be my friend and close enough possibly in age to me so I can, you know, look upon as a friend. With Chinua Achebe, I was absolutely blown away. Nana, Nana, Nana. Yes. You, you've taken your eight minutes. You want to take one more minute? One minute to uh, close. Okay. Yeah. So, Achebe was there uh, talking, and, you know, the dynamics was that of, like, father, son, or big brother, m more like father, son. And to me, it was like Baldwin finally finding that person who, in his novel, his character, James, couldn't, couldn't find. Somebody who is sensitive enough to understand him and his, you know, accept him as he is and guide, you know, just let him be without changing him. Achebe was, I was watching him like, totally mesmerized. That's about all I can say at this point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, Aliko. Aliko Tongolo. Thank you. Memory is a fickle friend. Accounts of the historic event that we are commemorating today vary greatly in the details. Some say or write that the encounter between Chinua Achebe and James Baldwin took place at the opening of the annual African Literature Association Conference. Others say, all right, that the encounter happened during a plenary session in the middle of the conference. I remember that it happened during the traditional closing banquet. I was not there at the very beginning at the, uh, of the conversation between our illustrious guests I was vice president of the African Literature Association and was probably stuck in an executive committee meeting or perhaps a business meeting. For business meetings and executive committee meetings in those years were long affairs as we struggled year after year with South African apartheid related issues. If I were to be tested on the substance of the conversation that took place between the two authors, I would fail miserably. There are perhaps recordings or written reports. Achebe visited Wisconsin in 1992, where I had moved a year before from California. 
A small panel, including him, was organized, and by way of welcome, I reminded him of the Gainesville incident. He was surprised that I remembered it. Much later, he wrote that he had greeted Baldwin that evening in Gainesville by paraphrasing the most famous greeting proffered by one lost explorer to another as they met over a century before in the town of Ujiji in today's Tanzania. Mr. Baldwin, I presume. For his part, Baldwin said something to the effect that this meeting between them was not supposed to happen, that the forces of obscurantism in America were against the meeting of two black men who can think. Baldwin's premonition proved to be immediately prophetic. At first, it sounded like a prank. A voice coming through the public address system of the Holiday Inn's banquet room began responding to what Baldwin was saying. At first, it seemed strangely funny. It seemed as if it was intended to be some kind of vaudeville show until the N-word appeared, until threats appeared. We are watching you, Mr. Baldwin, said the voice. Someone went to alert the front desk, but the front desk knew nothing about it. Someone had infiltrated the sound system from the outside. Today, we would say, hacked into the system. And this person was perhaps even watching the proceedings. Expressions of surprise quickly turned into shock and into anger and perhaps into fear. The unknown yet, in retrospect, familiar voice, distant yet all too close for comfort, concealed but all too present voice in America, disrupted the moment of intimacy that linked two brothers and them with the assembly, the assembled uh, members of the African Literature Association. In the intervening years, I have reflected on the encounter from time to time, less on the incident itself, although I've never forgotten it. The idea of inviting these two writers was an excellent one. We have always invited writers, but James Baldwin might have been the first African-American we had invited. Neither writer was a stranger to me. I had read Things Fall Apart and probably A Man of the People, at least by then. While conducting my dissertation research on Aimé Césaire and Negritude a decade earlier, I fell upon James Baldwin's essay, Princes and Powers, in which he reported on the proceedings of the first Congress of Black Artists and Writers in Paris in 1956. Although a graduate student in the Department of French and Italian at the University of Iowa in the early 1970s, I also hung around the newly created Department of Afro-American Studies that had afforded me a secondary teaching assistantship to teach Swahili in response to African-American student protests. I learned much about the Harlem Renaissance and other African-American writers who, according to Lillian Kestelot, were instrumental in the, in the development of Francophone, African, and Caribbean literature. I was ambivalent about princes and powers. I find it, on the one hand, to be an excellent summary of the Negritude Congress. At the same time, however, I found it to be more than a tad condescending towards Africa and Africans, except the intellectuals such as Alioune Diop and Leopold Sédar Senghor, whom Baldwin nonetheless did not seem to understand because of the admixture with French culture. Although the essay was replete with great insights deep into the souls of the speakers and physical descriptions that bordered on the sensual, I found its tone to be supremely derisive of the idea of African culture as long as the continent was under colonial rule. Thus, 
Baldwin protested vehemently in the essay when Senghor suggested in his speech that day that Richard Wright was an African writer. No, Richard Wright is an American writer, a Western writer, whose African culture was irremediably lost in the Middle Passage. I wondered, paraphrasing Conte Cullen's famous poem, what is Africa to James Baldwin? A man who, though attached to his American umbilical cord, was at ease in France to his dying days in the small town of saint paul de vence in the south of the country. He was at home enough in Istanbul, Turkey, to move there to write one of his masterpieces, Another Country. Content enough, in a small Swiss village, chalet, in Le Chalemain, to have written some of his most arresting work, such as the novel Go Tell It on the Mountain and the essay Stranger in the Village. A worldly man, a complex man, but the most he could say about Africa is that it, was, uh, that it is a conundrum. For this reason, then, when I saw that James Baldwin was going to join Chinua Achebe at the LA, I prepared myself for a great clash of ideas and ideals. For Achebe was as secure in his Africanness as Baldwin was in his Americanness, and the twain shall not meet. To be sure and to be fair, by 1980, James Baldwin had changed his outlook on Africa. In his later writings, he had reflected a great deal more about the black man, not only in America, but in the world, and thus had problematized a great many issues that had seemed self-evident in 1956, when he was 32 years old. Although he never wrote a full-throated book on Africa, his visit to Guinea, Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire, and Liberia in 1962 began to change the tone of his writings about Africa. By the time Achebe and Bolden met in Gainesville in 1980, they knew quite a bit about each other's writings. Achebe had read at least Go Tell It in the Mountain, which, according to his own account, had blown his mind, and he was disappointed for not being able to visit him during his first trip to the U.S. Baldwin, on the other hand, having read Things Fall Apart, declared that he recognized everybody in the novel as being Harlemites, including his own father. It was no surprise then, except for me, that Baldwin should say of Achebe in Gainesville, quote, my buddy whom I met yesterday, my brother whom I met yesterday, who I have not seen in 400 years, it was never intended that we should meet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, last and certainly not least, Dorothy. Thank you. It's actually, it's kind of good that I'm last because the more academic papers uh, were presented. I was, uh, I had just finished my PhD at Stanford when the Black Scholar Journal asked me to go to Gainesville to interview Achebe and Baldwin. <clears throat> so they, I hear an echo, is that okay? So anyway, uh, let me go again. So I was sent by the Black Scholar to interview them. And uh, they gave me a letter. So when I got to the place where I was staying, I went and knocked on the door and Baldwin and Achebe's handlers, some people putting it together, said, oh yeah, we've been expecting you. You'll have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with them. <laughs> so I got to spend breakfast, lunch, and dinner with uh, Baldwin and Achebe <clears throat> from, the, from the, the whole day. And some of you have already talked about the event, so I don't need to go over that again. And my article on it, uh, James Baldwin and Chino Achebe to define an aesthetic was published in the Black Scholar uh, volume 12, number two in 1981. So I don't have to go over that again. 
So I thought I would just share some of the things that uh, I observed. I was really supposed to be like a fly in the wall, not say anything. So that was my role, just to be with them, but not to be involved in their conversations. <clears throat> Although they started to pull me in, but mainly the from the time we had breakfast, it would just be the three of us. From the time, and I was just quiet, just writing down whatever I thought was appropriate. Then suddenly, lots of people would come into the room. And then I was like in the couch, just kind of observing everything going on. Uh, people, um, people were lined up outside the door from from uh, Nigeria, who said they couldn't get to Achebe in Nigeria, so they had come to this conference to get to see him. And that was that was just, I mean, quite a few people. So let me just kind of briefly, in my few minutes, uh, share some of the what I observed. I have in conversation. At one point, I didn't know whether it was lunch, dinner, when it, not dinner, but l lunch or breakfast. They were talking about uh, having seen their own fathers in each other's books, mm -hmm. in Things Fall Apart and Go Tell on the Mountain. I remember Achebe said to Baldwin, when I read that, I thought I was reading about my own father. And, and Baldwin said the same thing. They, it was like, love happening in front of me as I sat there watching, not butting in, just watching, taking notes, the, the expressions on their faces, the joy, whatever the static between two continents and whether you're African or African-American, uh, because Baldwin was African-American, not just American, whatever the, the lives that we've lived have distanced us you couldn't see it between those two guys coming together. They were like, they had known each other. They loved each other immediately. Here was Baldwin, a little bit shorter and thinner, and that was before Chabin's accident, so he's taller. And it was like they were the same size. And and just the fun they were having, getting falling in love, in a sense, and, and enjoying each other. This is what I was observing. I, I just kept feeling... Uh, it, it, the spirit, the spirit of them coming together like this. So they talked about uh, how they felt reading each other's uh, the novels and how important it had been to them. Uh, there was no difference that, that, that they expressed that they felt toward each other. Um, they just bonded and talked about different things at one point when they were talking about each other's uh, novels. <clears throat> I did bite in a little bit to say, uh, oh, when it, I was young, keep it in mind. <laughs> this was 40 some years ago. I was young and, oh, I'm sorry. And and I said, um, uh, uh, um, Mr. Chebe, can I tell you where well, you made a mistake and things fall apart? <laughs> and, and he, and, I mean, they were so gracious, you know. He said, yes, tell me. I said, well, when Oconquo's father uh, killed him, it wasn't because he didn't want to look weak. It's because these other old guys were just punching him and kid, kidding him and not killing him at once and totally. So he and he was he was smiling. He said, "That's an interesting way." I can't remember his words, but he graciously uh, 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 looked, thought of it, you know. And and I felt like, oh, I shouldn't have said anything, but you know, he received it. I, what I'm trying to do is create the mood. The mm -hmm. mood was loving, the mood was in, in, mm -hmm. inclusive. And then at uh, one point, <clears throat> I don't know which one of them said they wanted an ice cream cone. So the three of us jumped in a cab to go find a place where you could get an ice cream. <laughs> so that was that was kind of the, the experience that I was having with them. Mainly though, just being quiet. It was only that a couple of points where they turned to me. So it got to the point where uh, as we traveled and did these, uh, spent the whole day because my my room was down the hall from their suite. They were in the same suite, and as I said, most of the time the rooms were, were full except when they were eating. And um, then, of course, that evening you've already talked about what happened that evening uh, uh, of the event and the the, the uh, interruption and the word coming on, which was. As an African-American, that was not surprising to me that 
some racists could interfere with the station because we there's we've always known that it's continued struggle. So that, you know, it's always annoying. You never accept it, but it's always annoying. But in terms of the two men coming together and meeting, it was a wonderful. And now as I'm older, I look back on it and I think, wow, what a blessing that was that I got to spend mm -hmm. that kind of time with them. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, at the time I was just a black scholar asked me to go. I'd read both their books, but I didn't at that point even take pictures because I, I didn't think it was appropriate. I was supposed to just be there in the background. If today I would have had my iPhone. <laughs> but at that period, I didn't. So when I was asked, did I have any pictures of the event? I don't. I just I think I still have the letter from the Black Scholar and and being welcomed. But it was it was just wonderful. At the event that night, I was at the same table with the two of them, but again, in a quiet position. But they, they got to the point where they would say, okay, come on, Dorothy, we're going here now. So it was even when we went to get the ice cream, I sat in the back and they were in the front with the driver or the way it was, they were together or maybe I was in the front and they were two of them were together. I was never interrupting except that the one point about the book. But again, I saw, uh, I saw a, co a connection of two black people enjoying each other with no separation based on place of birth, no separation based on identity. I remember when I think it was Bill Moyers or Dick Cavett interviewed James Baldwin and he said, it must be difficult being black and gay. And he said, no, I hit the jackpot. <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. And that wonderfulness is what Achebe looked at Baldwin in appreciation and respect of a whole person. And Baldwin just just seemed to be enthralled and just mm -hmm. so happy to be embraced by Achebe so fully. Mm -hmm. Because you could see they were that they were embracing each other across no divides. Mm -hmm. And that as a young woman really affected me throughout my I think throughout my life. That, that kind of immediate loving and there being no divide between two two people, regardless of any criticism that the Baldwin had had. It's just unfortunate that uh, people have to criticize uh, people who come before them because, you know, people came after Baldwin, young writers who uh, criticized him or like the, um, <clears throat> the argument between uh, Mir Baraka and Spike Lee. So, but we're we're normal like anybody else. You know, whites have terrible arguments about things over the past. So over their differences. So overall, I would say from my sharing is as what I've already said, two great people, two brothers from different continents, different his personal histories in life, but aware of each other's connectedness. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Well, I think this gives us a very wide gamut of responses, um, reflections on this uh, extraordinary um, night and the two people at the heart of that. And as we have a few minutes left, I want to invite you all to offer any comments you might have on the other panelists' um, presentations. Okay. I see a hand from Ken. Ken. So, Eileen, when we spoke earlier, you had you had opened up the perspective of how we think today. Yes. And um, I'm thinking about you growing up in the South, in New Orleans, having come to the North, but you turned continually to the South. I want to hear your voice on us of today, not just remembering what happened in the past, which is wonderful to hear everyone else's memories. They've refreshed mine, what I've forgotten and rang so true, I was really happy. But I want to hear your, I want, what your reflections now, really that now of, I mean now, and how that, where we are now, would shape, you know, how we might respond to what we remembered of the past and at that moment. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I, I tried to think about what I would say more extensively if I were one of the panelists. And, um, the fact is, of course, that I have fallen in love hopelessly with James Baldwin. 
this is just how it is. I teach this course called Black Paris, um, and Baldwin is one of the star attractions of that class. There, there are a couple of others that I adore, Josephine Baker and Claude McKay. Um, and then I do Sartre, because he wrote a fabulous little play called The Respectful Prostitute based on the Scottsboro Boys case that, that Richard Wright apparently talked to him about, which I love. It was panned by the, the Paris, you know, illiterati or whatever, literati, not illiterati. Maybe they were illiterate, but um, so, so, and Baldwin, what I have come to appreciate in Baldwin, you know, there's this, this professor at Columbia whose name is, I can't even remember his name, Locate or something like that, who says that He's named what he thinks are the most powerful essayists of the century, and Baldwin is one of those five or six people. I love Baldwin's passion. I love his honesty, even when it's painful. Um, I can, in that story I mentioned this morning, this evening, so soon, he he opens up what is essentially um, what is essentially the. The, the enormous problem of, of black, of what then Toni Morrison goes on 30 years later, 40 years to call playing in the dark. And it's right there. I mean, I, I want to write about it, but you know, maybe somebody out there will write about it before I do, but it's, it's stunning. I'm impressed with his honesty. I'm impressed with his, with the, with the sharpness of his words. Um, I just think this was, and, and, and of course I don't agree with everything that he says. I mean, Aliko actually, when I wrote this thing yesterday about um, his, you know, his, um, his, his response to, um, to black people in the modern world, I thought, gee, must I say this? It was the truth. But I felt, well, this is going to cast a little shadow on Baldwin. But I tried to say it in such a way that I thought it opened up some possibilities. And later, Aliko picks, he actually talks about the later Baldwin. And I just sort of added that impromptu because I think Baldwin was someone who was honest and he would say things that were painful, even if they were, even they were what they thought. So I'm, I was very taken with Baldwin. I'm still taken with him. I think he's one of the most powerful writers we have. And you can't ask somebody who's working their way through things. And this is true for Frantz Fanon also. Um, you can't ask somebody who's working their way through to get everything right on day one or day two. Um, these are processes. And I think he was deeply pained by his sense that he couldn't claim the riches of the the supposed universal white culture um and and i think i'm it's gratifying to think that later he comes to a realization of that there there's several essays in that book notes of a native son that i think are really worth reading and that short story he writes when he in, in um in um going to meet the man and when he says something to the effect that that life is lived not at the level of armies and churches and and power structures but in fact they are also a part of of what shapes us um i just think baldwin is has enormously rich insights even when he's not always on target that that's what i think about baldwin achebe achebe i i i mean i wrote this little piece about achebe for um for Simon Gikandi for PMLA. And I, I tried to ask, would there have been an African literature without Achebe? Because not only did he write a story that's powerful, but his aesthetic, which was the incorporation of oral traditions becomes the aesthetic that people take to be the aesthetic. And that has its upsides and its downsides. Um, so I've talked a lot. Let somebody else say something, but thank you. Okay, Dorothy, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to um, I, I want to mention Achebe's, I can't think of the article, but his, his strong piece that brought really needed critique to Joseph Conrad. Oh, when, okay. When he, when he talked about you're cheering it, and then all of a sudden you realize that the people being devalued is, are you, you know? It's kind of like growing up watching movies 
uh, and and seeing the, the Africans made to look stupid, and you have to make grab yourself out of vicariously identifying with the wrong people. Yeah, yeah, and that's such a powerful. I, I quote Achebe on on that um, really often about that uh, particular piece of where that's what I give to my students. I can't think of the the title of it, and it was quoted in a not a long ago article in the New York Review of Books. Achebe's uh, strong piece in that. I don't know if I read this or if he said it when I was at the event observing them, but he mentioned that when he Starts, I'm talking Chebe now, when he starts a new novel, his wife knows she's not going to see him for a while and he's only next door okay. <laughs> to what he's writing. Yeah. And I don't know if I read that or if that's what I heard. I'll have to, to go back and look it up. Uh, I, yeah. Um, okay. I, yeah. The, the whole uh, business about Joseph Canwright, one of the things I think that that's a real testimony to is the power of, of the, the gaze in writing and in film in particular. I think that, that that shows us exactly how strong the the form is and, and the, the way it which it engulfs you before you have to say, wait a minute. So I think that's a that's an interesting comment as well. Somebody else want to raise a question? I mean I was really struck well, I was struck initially by Ken's piece um because I thought it opened up the whole sort of what was happening then, what's happening now how we've moved, um, and, and Aliko as well, um, I think that that whole question of that essay, which is a really extraordinary essay, because one of the things I think that we don't really pay attention to is the fact that, um, I mean, I agree, that this reminds me of that saying by, um, what's his name? Um, was it Cabral? Um, that my father used to say, it's an ill wind that blows no good. I mean, that's a, that's one of my father's folk sayings. And for me, what that's about is the fact that what one of the big points in Baldwin's terrible, um, you know, analysis of Césaire is um, how did colonialism make a man like him? I mean, we're slapping colonialism and it needed to be slapped. Um, but 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 if you were able you could get something that we could use to go forward. And of course, Richard Wright is all about that in the Paris conference um, in 1956. But just that, um, that, that yes, yes, there's a critique there. But in fact, we, we got things. And that, that's what Cabral was saying, essentially, that it's just, just because it's bad doesn't mean there's nothing you can get. You can get something and get it and use it. And um, I, I, I was ta I'm taken by that. But I see Aliko wants to respond to that. Yeah, there was, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, abonder dans ton sens, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, that essay, Princes and Powers, is great at, at drawing contradictions. Yes. And the one thing that surprised me was uh, how well uh, Baldwin treated uh, Richard Wright. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, because uh, elsewhere they're 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 enemies, yeah. but he finds himself uh, in Paris. Uh, uh, Richard Wright is, uh, introduces him to the American delegation, and then uh, then he defends him against some laws, uh, insistent that uh, Wright is an African uh, writer. You know, and the, there are many places where there, you know, the contradictions that are inherent in French colonialism of Africans uh, make him see a truth that the Africans don't see. Yeah. So, I don't understand. I mean, hear? yeah, go ahead. Doris, I didn't hear. No, that, that the Africans don't see, could you? And this that part. Yeah, the, the, the Africans there, because of, uh, you know, sort of the veil of uh, French culture, do not see certain truths about themselves that are contradictory. Yeah. And, uh, and, but and uh, Baldwin brings them out. Baldwin, I mean, Baldwin is really insists on the fact that the people like himself and Wright are 
they are Americans, and there's a different there's a different um, trajectory. There's a different set of problems, and he's he recognizes that there's something profoundly different. It isn't just being black, which is which is partly. Senghor's the way in which Senghor, I think, was 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 projecting that at that point. The negritude, yeah, with the negritude. I I think Baldwin, um, he you know, I mean, he has that last piece, Stranger in the Village, when he talks about the fact that, um, I mean, if the if the white supremacists who broke in that night read any, if they read that, it's no wonder they broke in because he was saying, you white people think you're white, but the fact is, you are as mixed as you think you've made us. You all are mixed. You all are black in some ways, and we are also so that there's a kind of um, yeah. we're, we we may be hybrid. And I think there's a way in which the white overview could be. Well, yeah, we made you. I mean, that's sort of the way people talked about Obama. Well, his mother was white, you know. Therefore, he's 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 hybrid. But the fact is, Baldwin was saying, "Y'all think y'all are white, but y'all are partly black." When, was, I, when, hmm? when I remember from that banquet, we're bringing it back now was how American Baldwin not only was, but insisted upon being in his relating to Achebe. We were not used to having Americans speak to us at the ALA. And that that came across that, that Baldwin conveyed, as you are saying, his Americanness. Yeah. One, and I, I have a sort of question maybe for everyone. Yeah. I don't know why I think Alico will answer it. I hope he will. But I'm thinking of the Baldwin of then has morphed and morphed by... I am not. Uh, I am not your Negro. The Raoul Peck film, which put Baldwin very much back on a major horizon. That film was a great success, and they gave a picture of a Baldwin who was who was very dynamic. Who was very what's the word I want? Someone who was a, a real fighter, and, mm -hmm. and and that reconstructed the image of Baldwin. Baldwin I think in the uh, in the popular imaginary. Yeah, Alec, mm -hmm. what do you think? You know, uh, I had great success teaching that uh, film, uh, both in Marseille and in Saint Louis in Senegal. Uh, and it was new at, the, at that time. This was uh, two years ago, I believe. And, um, and I, I asked, because um, Raoul Peck was uh, here in Milwaukee uh, showing it. And I went there and I, I asked at that time because I'd been looking for things which Bolden wrote about Africa. You know, I mean... Yeah. long essay or big book or whatever, and I could not find one. Uh, I found one, I found Black Power by, by Richard Wright, uh, but Baldwin, I expected that he would have uh, something. But uh, that film is is a real success in showing how what I called that Baldwin was tied to his uh, uh, umbilical cord in America, that he would not mm -hmm. let go of it. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's absolutely clear there, yeah. uh, but, but, but it's not absolute. You all, it is well past our hour. But can I say one little thing that's important. All right. It's interesting that we talk about uh, whether we are African or African American, but Europeans do the same thing. We're all here from someplace else. So you know, what's this big deal? I mean, do, do European does? When the Kennedys went to Ireland, did they think they were actually Irish? No, they were Irish Americans. Right. So we need we need to bring that the, the Europeans are as hyphenated, quote unquote, as anybody else. Okay. So I just I think it's important to to recognize that. And, and real quickly, James Cone, you know James Cone, the liberation theologist, he quotes this in his main lecture three people: Baldwin and I mean Baldwin, King, and Malcolm. You all, I'm going to have to um, stop at this point. I wanted to ask Nana if you had a comment, but maybe we can, we will actually have time to think this over. We can see this, I'm sure, before October 22nd. And at that point, um, we may have some additional thoughts on what we've all said. So Nana, do you want to have the final word? OK. That contrast between Achebe and Baldwin, you yeah. know, the father-son dynamic. And uh, for me, finally seeing, feeling like Baldwin has found in Achebe the father that 
failed him in real life. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I think that that's a really interesting perspective. Well, who I was talking about, this one thought he was the father, that one thought the other was the father. Because in fact, Baldwin is older than, than, than Achebe. They were more uh, like brothers. There were more, and I remember, I remember each one feeling humble in front of the other. So, but anyway, why don't we, we can pursue this soon. Okay. And I think we should, we should close here. Thank you all very much. And I look forward to the, to the sequel. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.